church family. It's a beautiful Sunday. We're thankful that you're here as we put a bow on, no pun intended, well maybe pun intended, a bow on 2020. We hope you had a Merry Christmas this past weekend. Hope you got to spend time with your family or uh, just whether it's immediate family or you had a bigger gathering. Just hope that you had a great holiday. Um, that song that was just sung to us, it's not one we sing all the time, but I think it was one that we are familiar with. I asked Uh, Kevin deleted it, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. And it wasn't until we were just singing it that I realized that would have been, had we known everything that was going to happen this year, that would have been the perfect year, or perfect song to start the year. Um, Because it's about what we should do. We should let the beauty of Jesus be seen in us when all these troubles arise. And if we had known, then yeah, that would have been a great year, a great um, song to make as part of our theme for this year, but we didn't know. How could we know? Let's think about that. It's just to kind of expand on that idea a little bit um, this morning before we dig into the sermon. This isn't working. <laughs> I'm going to have to cue you guys in the back, okay? Go ahead and hit the next slide, please. Uh, as we think about the year that has been, I want to show you something on the screen behind me. This, if you remember, it was last year that I talked about this. I had done a, a mock up of my year. Uh, 2019. I did this at the end of 2018 in prep for last year. And I basically just put one square for every day and I color coded it based on the end of the day, how I felt the day was. If it was a good day, it might have been gray or just good, red or yellow. Or if it was kind of neutral, nothing happened at all worth noting, um, I would have put that green. Or that if they were a bad day, just bad in general, just one of the worst possible days I could ever have. That would be blue or purple. And so I just marked through my day. At the end of each day, I would get in there and I would just evaluate and think, how was my day today? I didn't give any specifics. I didn't take any notes or put any log or journal down. I just ended the day with just a thought, kind of just a gut instinct, how the day was, and then color-coded it. And then as I finished the year, there it was. And I made that observation, if you remember, if you were here last year, how this is what my year looked like. And even though I can't remember every single thing, I can identify a couple of those squares. I can remember by looking at, you know, the key, the day and the month. I can remember why a, such a day was a good day or why a day was a bad day. And one thing doing that did for me and helped me was if I noticed I had a streak of good days going, I would wake up that morning knowing that and think to myself, I want to keep that streak of good days going. Or if it was a, streak, a series of bad days, I would think, I want to break that streak and have a good day would force my power of positive thinking, if you will, to try to will that into existence. And it didn't always work, but at least it focused my mentality that I would try to have a good day. One other thing that it did is I would look back at that whole year and I would think, you know, there were some days that were really bad. There were some weeks that were really bad, but look at that. There were a lot of good and great days. Now, that's just for me. You had your own year in 2019. There were a lot of good and great days. There may have been moments here and moments there where I realized, you know, things are bad. But looking at the whole picture, it seemed pretty good. All right, pull up the next slide, fellows. This is our 2020. <laughs> I'm kidding. I actually did start a 2020 version. I got through about April or so, just as the pandemic started to get really bad. And I thought, I have a hunch where this is going to go, and I don't want to have to look at that at the end of the year. I don't want to have to make reference to that as I'm doing right now. So just forget. Hit the next slide, please, Philip. So your year probably was not like mine. Your year may have been kind of where you thought, you know, this is going to get better. This is going to get better. And then as you went into it, you got into it more, and it just got worse, and it got worse, and there was really nothing that you could do. I'm going to try. They say it's working. It is great. And you would think, there's nothing I can do. And maybe you'd think, there's no way this could possibly get any worse. And then it would just get worse, and it would get worse. I understand that. I said this uh, back when we had the morning worship earlier this morning, and I'll, I'll repeat it to this crowd. I'll bet you if I ask this audience, how did you spend this year? How did your year go in 2020? If I asked you that in January, January 1, what are your plans for 2020? What, how do you think it's going to go? And then now I ask you here, December 27th, 2020, did those two things line up? I'll bet you not a person would say, yes, what I planned is what I got. Maybe some minor things here and there, but big picture, I highly doubt any of us could say. In fact, I would go so far as to say, if you're somebody sitting there, yep, this year went exactly like I planned, you're the devil. 
because we need to stop you from planning again because this year should not have been the way any of us planned. There are so many things. In fact, so many things that we take for granted. So many things we just assumed would be the way they are that ended up not being. How many of you even consider the possibility that we would have a period of time when on Sunday we would not be in this building singing together, communing together, hearing a sermon together, praying together? I took that for granted. I just naturally assumed. And so Alex and I, we planned all of our sermons around the year, around the theme of this year, with the expectation that we would be right here, standing in front of this audience, with many more people than we have this morning, preaching to you, singing with you, praying with you, communing with Jesus with you. And yet there was a period there when we were all of us in our pajamas watching at home, right? None of us could have expected that. The fact is, the devil has thrown everything he could at us this year. We set for ourselves in January of 2020 a theme. But it wasn't just a theme. We set for ourselves a goal that we were going to spend this year fixing our eyes on Jesus. Now, I don't care what happened outside of these walls. I don't care what happened to other churches. I don't care what happened to other people. Anyone else in the entire world, it doesn't matter. I'm talking to just these people who are part of the North Heights Church of Christ. Whether you're here or you're watching it at home. If you're part of the North Heights family, we set a goal for ourselves this year. Our collective congregational resolution was our eyes are going to be on the King. And we said to ourselves, no matter what comes our way, we're going to fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We set that as our goal. The devil heard that goal. And the devil has spent all of 2020 trying to knock us off that goal. I'm not saying we're the center of the universe. I know he's been doing a lot of work everywhere. But at least congregationally, I think we can all say he has worked very hard this year to make us not fix our eyes on Jesus. To give us every possible distraction and reason not to just focus on the King. Am I wrong? I don't think so. This year has been challenging. This year has been hard in ways unprecedented. We were supposed to be fixing our eyes on Jesus this year. And you know what? When we had that period where we were not together, and then finally it was announced, we're going to come back together. And It was the one sermon this year that Alex and I changed. We, we said we need to do something that kind of commemorates this coming back together. In the course of that discussion, as he and I planned that sermon together, not once in those discussions did we ever say, you know what, maybe we should scrap the theme and do a new theme this year. Let's start fresh, let's start over. We obviously aren't fixing our eyes on Jesus, so let's just do something else. No, we didn't even think the thought. Because we understood providentially how perfect this theme was for this year. We could never have anticipated it when we had this idea. And Alex had the idea years ago, because 2020, vision, fix your eyes on Jesus. We never could have anticipated needing that theme this year. But boy, have we needed this theme this year. Because we've had every reason not to fix our eyes on Jesus. We have needed to study about who He is and why He's worthy to focus on. So let me end this year, the last sermon of 2020, by putting the theme in perspective. And asking the question, asking us to ask our, the question this year, have you seen Jesus my Lord? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, have you seen Jesus? Look around you. Look at the people in this audience. Do you see Jesus in the midst of us? Do you see Jesus on the face of each one of us? Have you seen Jesus this year? Let's let's pull back that question a little bit and spin it around. Have our neighbors seen Jesus this year? Have they seen Jesus at your work? Have your coworkers seen Jesus? Have your teachers seen Jesus? Have your students seen Jesus? Have the people in line at the grocery store seen Jesus? Have the people outside of our fellowship seen Jesus, my Lord, your Lord, our Lord? Have they seen Jesus? I'll tell you what they think they've seen this year. I'll tell you what they've seen this year. They've seen hatred. 
They've seen bitterness. They've seen cynicism. They've seen despondency. They've seen depression. They've seen the presumption of a worse day tomorrow than even was today. They've seen negativity. Why haven't they seen Jesus? Now maybe, maybe you're the exception. Maybe you've been showing them Jesus. I don't want to speak for you, and I certainly don't want to get up here on my high platform and act like I've been doing it and you haven't. Goodness, no. I'm just saying maybe you'll join me down in the gutter in recognizing that I haven't done a good enough job in fixing my eyes on Jesus and in showing Him to others. We all of us, I think, could say, as this year ends, the world needed us to show them Jesus, and we didn't quite do it. But you know what? It is 1227, 2020. We got three days left. Four days left. We're almost done with the year. We have that much time to end this year right. To show Jesus to our neighbors, our friends, our enemies, our co-workers, our loved ones, whomever. We have that much time left to fulfill our goal for this year. Not just to fix our eyes on Jesus, but to reflect His majesty to those who look at us. Now, how do we do that? What does that look like? We just ate a fellowship meal together with Jesus, as we do every Sunday. We all ate the communion bread. We all drank the communion cup. He was here in the midst of us. Did you see him? Now, you didn't see a guy standing five foot ten with dark skin and a beard. You didn't see that Jesus. You didn't see the Jesus who walked this earth for three and a half years as a minister. You didn't see that Jesus born of Mary and died on a cross after 30 some years of life. You didn't see that Jesus, but you saw Jesus. You felt Jesus, metaphorically speaking, because He promised us He would be in the midst of us when we took that meal. Therefore, Jesus was here. But did you see Him? Did you reflect Him for the rest of us to see Him? What does it look like to see Jesus? There's probably a very long list. I'm just going to give you six things. Six responses, six after effects, six results, what have you, that come to a person who sees Jesus. And what I want you to do as I give you these six things is ask yourself, in 2020, did I live up to these six things? Did I see Jesus, fix my eyes on Jesus, and, and have this result happen so that others could see Him too? If not, hey, you still have a few days left to make it right. If so, please help the rest of us. Because some of us haven't done it as well. What does it look like to see Jesus? What happens to a person who sees Jesus? Number one, what happens, what follows, what effect is confession. When a person sees Jesus, and I don't mean a hard-hearted person. I don't mean a cynical, negative person. I don't mean someone like the Pharisees who saw Jesus repeatedly and technically knew He was the Messiah, but refused to confess Him. John 12 tells us. Now, I mean the people with an open heart, an honest heart, a heart willing to change and learn and grow and be moved by Jesus. When they saw Jesus, what follows was something wondrous, something joyous, something positive. What followed was a confession of who Jesus was, a recognition of the fact, and then a giving of the heart over to it. Best verse to give you that illustrates that is John chapter 20, the text that was read to us a minute ago. The text on the screen you may be looking at in your Bible that was read to us involves Thomas, but you have to start a little bit before that. You've got to remember that Jesus first appears on the resurrection day all over the map. He's showing up all over these different places. He goes to the people on the road to Emmaus, and he talks to various women, all the different Marys, and all the people. He sees all these people in a positive light, and they reflect positively on him, so happy and overjoyed, elated that the king has risen, that Jesus, the dead man, is alive again. And then, toward the end of John 20, he appears before the disciples. There are ten in the room. Judas is gone. Thomas is just not present. The other ten are there. And Jesus appears in the midst of them. And they're so surprised. They're so shocked. They're so disbelieving. That according to Luke's account in Luke 24, he has to eat bread, uh, uh, honeycomb and broiled fish in front of them. Eat in front of them, not with them, but just to demonstrate that he's a real flesh and blood person. Because according to Luke, they could not believe it because they had so much joy. In other words, it was too good to be true for them to believe he was really flesh and blood standing before them. So he had to prove his flesh and bloodiness to them by eating in front of them. 
And then he leaves. And for a time, the disciples are just in awe. And they find Thomas and they say, you're not going to believe what happened. We saw the Lord. And Thomas responds to, to their news in a way very similar to the way the disciples responded to the Lord's appearance. He didn't believe either. And we always single Thomas out and we call him poor doubting Thomas and we scold Thomas like we wouldn't believe it either. And we forget that the disciples had the same thing, the same description applied to them. They did not believe, so Thomas does not believe. And all Thomas says is, well, unless I touch his hand, unless I touch his side, I will not believe, in parentheses, implied, either. You guys saw the evidence. Well, I need to see the evidence. And you can say all you want about how well he shouldn't have to see the evidence. I know, Jesus is going to say that. But the point is, that's just where his faith level was. And it was the same faith level as the disciples. They didn't believe it without the physical evidence either. And so the next time they're all together, Thomas with them, Jesus appears in their midst, John 20, 24 through 28. And he appears before Thomas and he says, hey, here's the evidence. Touch, touch my hand for yourself. Here's my side. Put your finger right there where the spear was run between rib bones and punctured heart. Put your hand there. Feel for yourself. They examine the physical evidence. And what does Thomas do? Does he, someone, does he say, someone give me a fish and let's let him eat in front of me because I need to see the evidence still more? No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't stare and scrutinize and wonder and speculate. No, he doesn't do that. When he sees Jesus before him, he shows more faith than the others. He falls on his knees and he confesses what he clearly knows to be true. He confesses, my Lord and my God. We are in the middle of a crisis right now in this world. And there are people who feel lost, aimless, adrift. They need a Lord. They need a Master. They need a Shepherd. Where are they going to find Him? They're going to find that Shepherd by finding you who knows the Shepherd. You can demonstrate, I, we can demonstrate Jesus is our Lord. We can confess that for them to see and know Him as their Lord too as our Lord and our God. Because there are people who are thinking tomorrow is going to be worse than today. Tomorrow will certainly be worse than today. How can things get any worse? I don't know, but they probably can. And they just get into this cycle of depression. We need to introduce them to our God who made tomorrow before it was ever born. Who holds the world and the future itself in His hands. My Lord and my God. Have you seen Jesus? If you have and confession hasn't followed, what's the matter? That's the only way other people will see Him too. Confession. Number two, when you see Jesus, what follows from an honest heart is salvation. Mark 16, 15 and 16, Jesus says to us, go into all the world and preach the Gospel to all creation or to every creature, the old Bible says. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. Go to all the world and preach the good news of me, Jesus says. Go tell other people that I died, that I was buried, and that I rose. Go tell that good news to people. And the people that believe it and are baptized in response to it will be saved. Now what does that have to do with our sermon? You're a Christian, Christian. You're someone who has believed and been baptized. And thus you have demonstrated for others to see the death, burial, and resurrection power that was physically done through Jesus and spiritually done by Jesus to you. You have the power to go to a people who want a reset, who want to start over, who want to say, my old life has been nothing but disaster and this pandemic has not helped. I just need a fresh start. You are the living embodiment of a fresh start. You're saved you had an old life that was dead and made alive again. You live the Gospel. Jesus says, go tell people the good news. Have you seen Jesus? Yes, I saw Him in the watery grave. I was buried with Him. And I rose. And now I see Him in life. Because He lives in me and through me. Do other people see that in you? Do other people see that in us? Have we seen Jesus? Have we shown people Jesus? the dead, buried, and resurrected Savior? Have you told them about your baptism? 
so that they might want to be baptized too. When we see Jesus, what follows is confession. What follows is salvation. What follows, number three, is transformation. Right along the same line. What Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old Bible says a new creature. Wait, that's very familiar. Didn't we just read that? Jesus in Mark 16.15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature or to every creation. In other words, Jesus says, I, Jesus, am the maker of this world. I, Jesus, created all the souls that are now lost. I gave them their first life. I breathe into them, as we talked about in Bible class this morning, the breath of life. I gave them that first life, their original life, and they squandered it, and they wasted it, and they threw it away with sin. Now you preach to them, he says, to us. And you tell them they can start over. They can be transformed. Because those who are in Christ, those who have seen Jesus, the old creation is dead, passed away. And behold comes a new creature. A new creation. I, Jesus says, I formed that life. And I can transform that life too. I gave it first life and first birth. And through me, he says, I can give it second birth. New birth. Life after spiritual death and resurrection. We are supposed to be living a transformed life. What that looks like to our neighbors is this. Boy, everybody else is panicking. Why isn't he? Everybody else is cynical. Why isn't he? Everybody else is hoarding toilet paper. Why isn't she? Everybody else is assuming the worst about tomorrow. Why isn't she? I'll tell you why. He and he and she and she. I'll tell you why they aren't. Because they are different. They are newborn. They have a new life. They see things differently. Their eyes are fixed on a different point. Not a bad tomorrow, but a great beyond where the Lord reigns as King. And when they see that in you, when they see that in me, like moths to a flame, they will be attracted to us. They will be drawn to us. And they will ask us naturally, how do you get like that? I want to be like that. You will not believe how many people are needing that. Just the feeling that you can get through a problem. Not even getting through the problem. Just the confidence that you can get through a problem is what people need in this world. And they find it when they find a Christian living this life. And they will ask you that question. And you will give them the answer, which is Jesus Christ. But if they're not asking you the question, maybe. If they're not asking us the question, maybe. It's because they're not seeing that transformation in us. In which case, we haven't been fixing our eyes well enough on Jesus. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? When you see Him, what follows is confession and salvation and transformation and glorification. Look at Romans 8, verse 30. And I've got to read this one because I always get it messed up. Romans 8, verse 30. Moreover, whom he, God, did foreknow. Sorry, I, did, I got it wrong and I'm reading it. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. You, Christian, are a predestined people. In other words, before you were ever you, before the great former ever formed you. He knew that you would sin, that you would need Him to save you, and He devised the way and the means by which you would be saved. He pre-planned your salvation. Now you still have to walk through that door. You still have to get up and do it. You still have to obey. But the means by which you can obey was made before you ever were you. Certainly before you ever sinned. And those whom He predestinated, He, by walking through that door are now justified. See, the very reason you even need salvation is because you sinned. And because you sinned, you are now no longer worthy in the presence of God. Adam and Eve walked with God in the Garden of Eden, but when they sinned, out the garden they had to go. I, you, us, we are not worthy to be in the presence of God, to stand before Jesus, to stand before God Himself in heaven's majestic glory. Because we have sinned, we've tarnished our souls, ruined the life He gave to us. So what is it that gives Jesus the right 
to pick us up and put us before God. Because that's what the verse says, Romans 8.30. We are glorified. Then he also glorified. What does the word glorify? Glory, glory, glory to the Lord of hosts. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The angel said as they heralded his birth. To glory and to glorify is to lift up. We do that to God. We glorify Him. We put Him on a higher plane. We put Him on a pedestal. We glorify Him. But this verse says He glorifies us. He picks us up and puts us in the presence of God. What right does Jesus have to do that? Me, a stinking, dirty sinner, don't deserve to be in His presence. How does He put us there? By justification. He justifies us. I will always have been a sinner. It is always something. There will always be a fact that I have sinned. I did the crimes. You can look them up. I can give you the dates. It's in my past. It will always be my past. The Lord may wipe it clean, but it still happened. And if I had a DeLorean, I could go back and I could see it happen. It really happened. We sinned. And yet, He's able to pick us up and put us in heaven. Why? Because even though I have sinned, it's just if I hadn't. Through His power, through His blood, I might as well not have been a sinner. It's just if I'd never sinned. And through that justification, through His blood, we are glorified. We have now, through, through Jesus, been placed by Jesus on a higher plane. The world, especially in the middle of a crisis like this, is wallowing and rolling and slinging mud. It's in a dark place right now. I don't know if you've looked around. The world's in a dark place right now. People are hurting. People are angry. People are frustrated. People are confused. People are paranoid. And they're all wallowing in the mud and the mire. You get to be someone that Jesus has picked up, not by your virtue, but by His, picked up out of the mud and cleaned off. So that others can look up and say, how come he gets to be clean? I want to be clean, and that's where we come in. And we can say, you can be through Jesus Christ and his blood. They see in us his cleansing power. They see in us his glorifying power. When you see Jesus, what follows is glorification. And what follows that, two more and I'm done, is illumination. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as He is in the light. Listen to it now. If we walk in the light provided by the Holy Spirit as He is in the light, Jesus the Son of God, then the blood of Jesus, His Son, God's Son, cleanses us from all sins. We have fellowship one with another. I know we read that, and some translations even say one with each other, but that's not the meaning of the verse. Listen to the text again. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus, His Son. Whose Son? The another's Son in whom we walk. We walk with God through Jesus by the light provided of the Spirit. That's the whole of the Godhead right there for us to enjoy. That is the illumination that comes with those who are in Jesus Christ. You get to walk in the light of Jesus Christ. And so it doesn't matter how dark the world gets. It doesn't matter how disappointing the world gets. It doesn't matter how depressing the world gets. We're in the light. Now to illustrate that, please permit me to recite to you my favorite Christmas song. Well, it's maybe not my favorite. I'm going to recite my favorite some other time. But I'm going to recite to you a very great Christmas song. One which tells a wonderful story that we don't often consider because when we sing, we hear tunes and we kind of recite the words without thinking about them and we don't really pay attention to what we're actually learning when you sing the song. So let's consider the story behind this song. So I'm not going to sing it to you because I want you to hear the words, not the tune. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. Though the snow lay round about deep and crisp and even, Brightly shone the moon at night, though the frost was cruel. When a poor man came in sight, gathering winter fuel, then the king says, Hither, page, and stand by me, if thou knowst it telling. Yonder peasant, who is he? Where and what's his dwelling? Then the page says, 
Sire, he lives of goodly kin underneath the mountain, right against the forest bend by St. Agnes' fountain. And the king says, Then bring me flesh and bring me wine. Bring me pine logs hither. Thou and I will see him dine if we bear them thither. Page and monarch, forth they went. Forth they went together. Through the rude winds, wild lament, and the bitter weather. Then the page says, Sire, the night is darker now, and the wind grows colder. It fails my heart, I know not how. I can go no longer. And the king says, Mark my footsteps, my good page. Tread thou in them boldly. Thou shalt find the winter's rage freeze thy blood less coldly. In his master's steps he trod, where the snow lay dented. Heat was in the very sod which the saint had treaded. Moral of the story, therefore Christian, then be sure, wealth or rank possessing, he who will now bless the poor shall himself find blessing. It's a very fanciful story. It's a very you know, heightened sense of reality to it, but it tells a powerful message of reaching out to help with benevolence those who are less fortunate and being blessed by God as, as a result. That's a biblical principle. But it teaches and reminds me of this verse whenever I sing the song. It reminds me that I walk in the shadow of a king. Not King Wenceslaus, who was just a duke anyway, but the real king, King Jesus. I walk in his shadows. I'm fixing my eyes on the back of his head. And when the wind gets really bad and the storm gets really dark and I feel really cold and my heart begins to faint and I begin to say it's not worth it, I want to tap out and give up, I look at his feet and I mark his steps and I walk where he walked. And fancifully, to just add to the song, to make out the song, even though I get really cold, when I step where he stepped, there's just heat radiating from it. And it warms my soul, and it gives me the motivation to take the next step and the next one. Look around you in this world. Throughout this crisis, you're seeing a lot of people sitting down and giving up. Their hearts are failing them. The storm is too strong. The winds are too great. The world is too dark, and they're giving up. And they're going to see us, if we're following Jesus, walking forward, pressing on, moving ahead. And they're going to wonder, what is giving that guy the strength? What is letting that woman have the courage to keep walking? And we're going to have the opportunity to say to them, because we're following the King to a better place. And you would not believe how motivating that is to people who are on the ground ready to give up. Have you seen Jesus this year? Have your neighbors seen it in you? Have they seen it in me as we've handled this mess? What follows when we see Jesus? After illumination, finally, is satisfaction. Again, the song, Therefore, Christian, then be sure, wealth or rank possessing, he who will now bless the poor shall himself find blessing. He who will not bless the poor will find no blessing. And that axiom is true. Provided for us in Matthew 25. If you do not help the poor, you will not be blessed with enter in forevermore. But if you do help the poor, you will hear the Lord say to you on his right hand, enter in, good and blessed one. To the joy prepared before you, or to summarize, enter in, he will say to us, to eternal satisfaction. Listen to the word. Satisfaction. What does it mean? I'm satisfied. I'm content. I don't need anything else. I don't worry about anything else. I'm totally at peace right now. This is bliss satisfied. Eternal satisfaction. And why? Because when we saw Jesus hungry and thirsty and naked and sick and in prison, we fed Him, we gave Him drink, we clothed Him, we went to visit Him and tend to His needs. At least that's what He'll tell us. And we'll say, Lord, when did we ever see you in that situation? And he'll say, when you did it to the least of these, when you looked out and you found the people who were hurting, who were in need, who were sick, and you tended to them, enter into eternal satisfaction. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord, this year? Have you seen the people tending to the sick, caring for the hurting, 
have they seen it in you and in me. When we see Jesus, six things happen. Confession. Have you seen Jesus? Give Him your life. What follows? Salvation. Receive His life. What follows? Transformation. Let Him remake your life. What follows? Glorification. Walk after His life. What follows? Illumination. Let Him light your life. And what follows is satisfaction. Leave this life to a better life forevermore. Before we close, if you'll permit me, I have this tradition of mine. It goes back to when I was at Higdon and then when I was a guy, and I think I did it last year here as well. But I like to read this poem as it relates to the Christmas time and the end of the year and just as a kind of a reminder. So indulge me for just two seconds. This is my favorite poem written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And I want to give you just a little bit of a biography, just, just five quick notes to tell you about this person, to build up to the poem. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow lived in the 19th century, around the time of the Civil War in particular. On July 10, 1861, at the very beginning of the war, his wife Fanny was killed in a house fire. A few months later, he marked on his diary, he kept a steady diary, he marked in his journal on Christmas Day, December 25, 1861, 61. He says, how inexpressibly sad are all holidays. You think he was having trouble with the circumstances of the day? One year later, December 25, 1862, he wrote in his journal, I can make no record of this day. Better to keep it wrapped in silence. Perhaps someday God will give me peace. One year later, December 25, 1863, his son was just wounded a few weeks earlier uh, as a soldier in the Union Army and lost his leg. A few weeks later, December 25, 1863, he writes, A Merry Christmas, say the children, but it is no more so for me. And then one year later, oh shoot, I'm going to cry again. I did it this morning. Prepare yourselves, I'm going to cry. December 25, 1864, near the end of the Civil War, he writes in his journal these words. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rung so long the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then from each black accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south. And with its sound, the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and made forlorn, <clears throat> here it comes, the households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and it mocks the song of peace on earth goodwill to men let me pause there's one more stanza can you sympathize with that last line have you seen hatred and have you tried as a christian to project peace the peace which christ provides to people who are so deep in the ditch they think it's a mockery and they say to you as you wish them a Merry Christmas. And as you wish them a Happy Christmas. And they say to you, there is no peace on earth. There is no merriment to be had. There is no happiness to be found. What do you say to that? He said, then peal the bells more loud <clears throat> and deep. God is not dead. Nor does He sleep. The wrong shall fail, and the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. We have it within ourselves, the power to bring people to know Christ, to let them find the peace that passes understanding. There are people out there, you don't even have to look hard anymore. There are people really hurting out there. They may be in this very room. They need peace. Jesus has it. We know it. Let them see it. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, the opportunity to become one is yours. If you are a Christian 
And you started this year with us, January 1, 2020, and you made the vow, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. And now as we bring the year to a close, you say, I have looked at everything but. Well, you can be restored. You can fix your eyes on Him again. If we can help you do that, give you the encouragement you need, whatever you need, please make your needs known right now as we stand and sing.